dog bites, now they just don't come out of anywhere. Now, according to the American Kennel Club, dogs bite for the following reasons. They could be afraid or they're startled. They could be protecting or guarding somebody. They could be in pain and they also could be frustrated. But we miss those warning signs that a dog bite could happen. Dogs do try to communicate discomfort prior to biting by barking or growling or snapping in the air. Then we look at bee stings. Well, why do bee stings sting us? Well, bees either sting because they're confused, they're stepped on, or it might be their only defense to get you away. So we have bee stings and we have dog bites. And those things happen to us that could probably make us sad or they hurt. And the universal trigger for sadness could be a loss of a valued person or an object. And we can get insight because sadness varies between different individuals based upon their personal definitions of value and loss. Some other triggers of sadness, endings or goodbyes, sickness or death, loss of some aspect of identity, and being disappointed by an unexpected outcome. Could be not receiving a job or a raise at work when you expected it. So we have when the dog bites, and when the bee stings, and when I'm feeling sad. I simply remember my favorite things, and then I don't feel so bad. Welcome to the Stephen Thompson Experience. My name is Stephen Thompson, and this is my experience. We're going on a journey using music and history as a roadmap, and at the end, hopefully, we have taken something old to teach us something new. This is the interaction between the spiritual, the secular, unlikely encounters in unexpected places, and the exploration of what happens and what is possible, all the while embracing who you are, who we are, and how together, whether it be one, two, or many, perhaps we can make our part of the world a little bit better than it currently is. I hope to educate, inform, and inspire. So dog bites, bee stings, and when we're feeling sad, well, those are lyrics from the song, My Favorite Things. It's a song from the 1959 Rodgers and Hammerstein musical, The Sound of Music. And you know what about the song of music? That song finished number 64 on AFI's 100 Years, 100 Songs survey of the top tunes in American cinema. And also many artists have gone on to record my favorite things. John Coltrane, jazz saxophonist in 1960, played a 14 minute version as the title track of an album recorded in October of 1960. And he released it in March of 1961. It became a jazz classic and a signature song for Coltrane when he played in concerts. And he played one in 1963 at the Newport Jazz Festival. Now, in 1964, Jack Jones became the first of many artists to include the song on a Christmas album. Now, the song doesn't have any lyrics, have anything to do with Christmas, but it began to appear on Christmas albums. Again, 1968, Tony Bennett recorded a version of the song that year and put it on his album, Snowfall, the Tony Bennett Christmas album. Herb Alpert in 1969 in the Tijuana Brass also recorded it on his Christmas album. Then Kenny Rogers in 1981 put it on his Christmas album, the Kenny Rogers Christmas album. 2013, Kelly Clarkson put it on her version on the Kelly Car Clarkson Christmas album. So a lot of artists use the song, My Favorite Things, on Christmas albums, even though it wasn't a Christmas song. So going back and looking at the lyrics, when the dog bites, when the bee stings, when I'm feeling sad, I simply remember my favorite things and then I don't feel so bad. Well, dog bites and bee stings are symbols of conflict we all face from time to time, but our favorite things are a way for us to overcome them. And one person who overcame symbolic dog bites and bee stings was Mary Eliza Mahoney, and she was born in the spring of 1845 in Boston. Now, the exact date of her birth is unknown, but she was born to freed slaves who had moved from Boston to North Carolina or moved from North Carolina to Boston. When she was a teenager, some of her favorite things was she liked to take care of people and she wanted to become a nurse. She started working at the New England Hospital for Women and Children. And that hospital 
was created to give health care only to women and children. What also was special about this hospital, it had an all women staff of physicians. So Mahoney worked there for 15 years in a lot of roles. She was a janitor, she was a cook, she was a washerwoman. She also had the chance to work as a nurse's aide and that allowed her to learn a lot about the nursing profession. Now, the New England Hospital for Women and Children also created one of the first nursing schools in the United States. Now in 1878, when Mahoney was 33, she was given admission to the hospital's professional graduate school for nursing. And the program ran for 16 months and it was a very challenging program. The students went there, went to lectures, they learned how to do nursing from firsthand experience in the hospital. Now, the thing about it is that a lot of students were not able to complete the program. In fact, only 42 students entered that program in 1878. And out of that 42, only four completed it in 1879. And Mahoney was one of the first women who finished the program. And that made her the first African-American in the United States to earn a professional nursing license. Now, when she finished her training, it was hard for her to follow a traditional career in nursing because of a lot of discrimination that she encountered when she began to be a nurse. So she became a private nurse and focused on the needs of individual clients. And those clients lived up and down the East Coast. And she was known for being very patient, efficient, and a great bedside manner. She also joined active nursing organizations. In 1896, she joined the Nurses Associated Alliance of the United States and Canada. But even there, she faced a lot of discrimination. So what she did is she felt that she needed to advocate for the quality of African-American nurses. So in 1908, she co-founded the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses, and they elected her the first national chairperson. So after decades as a private nurse, Mahoney became the director of the Howard Orphanage Asylum for African-American children in Long Island. And she served as the director there until she retired. She retired from nursing after 40 years. And one more interesting thing is that after the 19th Amendment was ratified in August of 1920, Mahoney was one of the first women who registered to vote in Boston. So going back to the song, here are some of the lyrics that emphasize the idea of our favorite things. Raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens, bright copper kettles and warm woolen mittens, brown paper packages tied up with strings. These are a few of my favorite things. Cream colored ponies and crisp apple strudels, doorbells and sleigh bells and schnitzel with noodles, wild geese that fly with the moon on their wings. These are a few of my favorite things. Girls in white dresses with blue satin sashes, snowflakes that stay on my nose and eyelashes, silver white winters that melt into spring. These are a few of my favorite things. Our favorite things, by focusing on our favorite things, it actually reduces our long-term stress and helps us to extend our life. There was a study done of telomeres, and telomeres are the end caps of our genes. And it shows that long-term stress can shorten those end caps, and shortened end caps are linked with early death. It was a study done. And these studies indicate that when we're dealing with something that's extremely powerful, the process of cultivating a positive emotion through pro-social behaviors, being generous, for example, may lengthen your life. And it's called the altruistic emotions or the helper's high, gain dominance over our stress responses. Another study showed that adults who volunteered to give massages to infants had lower stress hormones. In another study, students were simply asked to watch a film of Mother Teresa's work with the poor in Calcutta. They had significant increases in protective antibodies associated with improved immunity, and antibody levels remained high for an hour afterwards. Students who watched a more neutral film didn't have changes in antibody levels, thus dwelling on love strengthened the immune system our favorite things. So when I think about it, appreciation and gratitude are effective coping skills when dealing with a cynical negative world.
For example, in the morning when I'm off work, I head off to the beach and I listen to the waves and I watch the seagulls fly. I cast my problems and stressors into the ocean and I imagine the birds carry them off. When I leave the beach, I'm at peace and content. I remind myself of what I have. And even when I desire more or I'm upset about an event or circumstance that isn't going my way, at least I can turn to what I have. Now contrast that with a constant stream of news and social media posts, which tend to breed anxiety, anger, or a comparison trap. So why do that to yourself? Ask yourself, what can you appreciate today? What can you be thankful for today? You know, anxiety, fear, anger, doubt, and mistrust are powerful, but not all powerful. You can choose. So what is next? You could try appreciation and gratitude. So when the dog bites, when the bee stings, and when you're feeling sad, try to remember a few of your favorite things, and then it won't be so bad. Thank you for listening to the Stephen Thompson Experience. I come here to educate, inform, and inspire. This is a platform for leaders and followers, hopeful, optimists, careful, pragmatists, people who want to bend the arc of the universe towards justice. I hope I have moved a bit in that direction. And if not, I will try again next time. But as for you, remember, you have talents and gifts and achievements to pursue. Run and go do it. Run your race. Go do it. Thank you for listening to the Stephen Thompson Experience. This is the end of 2021. So happy holidays, and we will see you next year. Take care. Have fun celebrating with your families. Have a wonderful year. This is Stephen Thompson. Goodbye.